Pô, nunca vi uma montaria boa, né, cara? Só lixo. Qual é o nome disso aqui? 31. Esse aqui porque mesmo grau Pedro Pão é um bagulho de outra classe, não tem códex. E agora? Pra onde eu vou? Não tem mapa, né? Não sei pra onde eu vou. Esquerda e direita eu já fui. Nada demais aqui. Na verdade tem sim aí, ó. Oh, olha só, mano. Para depois pular, e agora acima. Borboleta amarela? Ok. 
de manutenção. Olha que maneiro. Tem uma lá embaixo. Ah, é momentâneo. Ah. Oh, desgrama. É momentâneo e. Eu fico sem chão. Tem que ir rápido. Blup. Tinha lá em cima. Não. Vai acabar o tempo. Vai agora. E agora? Esquerda? essa área, não foi? Quebra aqui. Uh! Vou subir? Como é que chegou lá em cima? There we go. Boom. Sobe. Aqui desce. Ente tá fazendo isso, já vi isso. Porra, é esse cara. Ai, ai, ai. Se foda então. Chegar lá em cima, não. Só por aqui, né? Mas se eu pegar Se eu usar o troço vermelho Eu perco o bichinho Ah, ele veio agora Deve ser por tempo Tem que ir mais rápido
Aí aqui, ó. Espera expirar o tempo. E agora. Bum. Bum. Vai. Foi. Preciso de duas bolinhas agora. O que a gente tá fazendo isso mesmo? Vai ter manutenção. Isso. Tá fazendo tudo? Bom. Oh. É do jogo. Esquerda, sobe aqui. Ixi, inverteu agora. Tem um fortalecimento de artefato, cara. Só tem um... Só tem esse artefato. Deveria upar ele. Esse aqui é o troço de comida. Não sei se eu vou ganhar mais. Vou ganhar um livro. E aí, Henrique? Ele está diferente? Vou ver esse lixo aqui. Os bichos são aqui, né? Tá. O uh... que eu ia fazer? Eu vou passar até fato se foda então. Não tá vindo outro. O índio pode ser destruído? Qual a chance? Uma já? Coloquei mais um só. Vai me dizer a chance não? Jogo estúpido. Hum. 
Não me diz a chance, então se foda, vai ficar assim mesmo. Fito uma égua. Henrique, boa noite. Esse é o jogo que você falou que não ia voltar? O jogo que não ia voltar? Não, esse jogo, esse jogo lançou, lançou ontem. É um... É um jogo da WeMate. É um jogo NFT. Conhece o Mir 4? Pois é. Mesmo lixo, mesma empresa. Vou jogar essa merda. Olha, eu tô deixando no alto aí, o jogo é totalmente automático. Pra ver se dá alguma grana. Comecinho de jogo. NFT é sempre assim. Se eu der alguma sorte aí. Bota o personagem pra vender e tchau. Ver se dá em alguma coisa. Vou ter investido aqui, o que eu faço? É desse mesmo que eu tava falando? Oh. É, mas no caso... No caso, esse é um novo jogo. Ah, tô vendo. Sobe aqui. Um novo jogo da WeMate. Mas é, é, é meu lixo. Igualzinho. Mesmo lixo. Mesmo conceito. Onde é que eu tô? Isso deu certo? Eu voltei aqui. Ligou a luz. Ó, oh, tá ali o que eu quero. Pera, então eu voltei pro começo? Ô oh, porra. Não, esse caminho aqui é diferente, yes? É diferente. Ah, vamos pra direita. Eu acho. Pega isso aqui. Aí eu vou. Vou ter que pular aqui. Ah, ok. Apareceu uma nova plataforma. Pronto. Aí quebra aqui e foi. Beleza. Foi uma bolinha. Preciso de mais uma. Pra abrir o portão. Se você tá gostando de Gris, você vai gostar de Celeste? Então, mano. Então. Eu tô pensando... Tô pensando mesmo. Esse cara falando em chinês ali. Ó, oh, quando... Por que que eu tô... Eu tô apertando o Enter e tá fazendo isso? Já é isso, porra. Eu quero... Eu quero abrir o chat, filhos da puta. Tá tirando da, da tela cheia, ó. Olha lá. Que negócio estranho. Bolso velho de Goblin? Ó que dropei. O que que é isso aqui? Usar na coleta de monstros. Material de coleta. Pra que isso, mano? Que lixo, hein? Você já faz nada? Tá mais 40 monstros. E aí tem a Raid. Eu vou. Eu vou manter aqui pra fazer a Raid. Chat não é T? Não. Minha equipe existe. Eu, eu, eu mais cedo eu tava apertando o Enter, tá ligado? E abriu o chat. Mas. Por algum motivo. Oh, recebi um negócio aqui. Por algum motivo tá fazendo isso agora, não entendi nada. Vai ter manutenção daqui a pouco, eu acho. Esse cara tava falando no chat. Ah... Ixi, vazou. Puta merda, vazou. Vazou a informação na minha conta, shit. Ô oh, diabo. Não tem as aqui não, mano. Conveniência. Câmera. Não. Ok. 
que eu ganho aqui? Pega o preço da comunidade. Ganhei 10 potes, 10 tonos de droga. Me dá alguns atributos aqui. Tonos da guarda. Deve ser TD ali embaixo no menu. Oh, nice. Oi, bate papo aí, te porra. Jogo estúpido. A gente faz isso? Tiapo. What do you mean, bro? Ah, oh, vai se foder então. Olha que lixo. Ah, oh, se foda. Onde é que eu tô? O que eu tenho que fazer? Pula ali no meio. E agora? Eu tenho uma bolinha. Então, pra direita deve, ser, deve ter a outra. Sempre assim, né? Esquerda tem um, direita tem um outro. Oh, mas o jogo é, é maneirinho até. Não tem nada demais, mas é viciante esses, esses, esses jogos assim. Bizarro. O quão viciante essas pestes é. Mas eu vou me controlar. Eu preciso me controlar, na real. Deixar no alto e adeus. Eu pulo pra onde? Ué. Pra cá. Ok, gato. Got you, bitch. Esquerda ou direita? Vou pra esquerda. Que sobe. Água. Eita porra. Inverteu. Por aqui. Boom. Quebra. Pra vir um bichinho. Pera aqui. Ah não, tá certo, tá certo. Aqui. Aqui. Quebra. Ok. Ali o trem. Por que não pulou? Ah, tá. Ok. Pega a água da, da direita. Aqui. Segue pra cá. Ô, oh, droga. Desce aqui de novo. Boom! Beautiful. There we go. Beautiful, dude. Fucking perfect. Vamos se abrir lá. Três bichos. Dois bichos na real. 
Ganhar alguma coisa. Uma frutinha? Framboesa. Usar na cola de monstros. As quests é beixa. Não dá pra ver a quest, né? Droga. Tava 80 bichos, aí completou. Apareceu mais 80 bichos. Filhos da puta. Tudo. O que é isso? Mantenha B. O que é isso? Tá com a ajuda do esquadrão suicida? Pelo menos esse é grátis. Ué, tem, tem o mesmo esquema de quests? Nossa, eu ouvi falar tão mal desse jogo. Esquadrão suicida. Fucking terrible shit. Eu não entendi o que isso aqui faz. Ah, ele me... Ele me dá um trem de jump? Não. Que porra isso faz? Mate os inimigos. Que merda, cara. Aquele jogo. Ah, ok. As flores... As flores desabrocham. Ok. I see how it is. E aí, com isso eu tenho um esse jump. É sem realidade, bro. Fez o um barulho estranho. Já foi isso. Eu não consigo seguir. Oh. Invisível. Pronto, cheguei. Boom. E agora eu vou pra onde, porra? Já peguei o que tinha que pegar lá. Esse aqui. Não dá pra passar ali. Eu não tinha pensado nisso. Eu só usei o trem ali. Não vi essa flowzona. São tantos detalhes. 
right? Esquerda e direita. Tem que pular ali. Peguei. Um... Sobe. Eu já vim aqui. Não sei o que eu tô fazendo. Bom. Oh. Isso é novo? Não sei. Não. Traga. Tem dos caras Não dá pra ver as informações do Maria PVP2 <risos> Não me dá a cut Que lixo, hein Tem um manto Manto de algodão Já tem um Codex. Opa. Ah, as frutinhas saem pra Codex também. Interessante, mano. Codex de monstro. Peso máximo, redução de dano. Nossa, aqui precisa de 30 frutas. Eu só tenho uma. Filhos da puta. O outro ali precisa de 3 só. Concluir esse lixo aqui. Manda esse cara calar a porra da boca. Nova spell. Fortalecimento físico. Pra mago, porra. Aumenta seus atributos. Defesa 2. Tá bom então. 10 mil real, thank you. Opa, pera aí. Tem cotes da capa. Esse aqui é mais fácil. Ah, registrei esse foda. Não sei da PT dos caras aqui. Já tô em outra. Beleza. Tem um ali embaixo. Tem um aqui embaixo, pô. Boa noite, Kokogami. Irei de dormidas. E eu, Bunarugo? Vai, Mimi? Boa noite, mano. Ah, chegou, já vai? Adeus. Kokogami, seu cu. Vai dar, hein? Smiley face. Pô, tinha um checkpoint ali, cara. 
Floresceu a pica. Eu tenho que chegar lá em cima para florescer o pênis. Ué, por que não floresceu de baixo? Fui enganado? Acho que eu não castei tudo. Troca. E agora para voltar lá para baixo? Não volta? Ih, mano, caguei na pica. Caguei no pênis. Aulinha amanhã? É. Também tô tendo minhas aulas, só que é à noite. Faculdade de lixo. Ai, mano. Eu preciso descer, velho. Pra fazer a mesma coisa que... Só que lá embaixo. Me fudi. E agora? Dá pra botar o checkpoint? Meia pica. Fuck. Ah, oh, pera aí. Pronto, pô. Daqui dá range. Daqui dá range, porra. Tá se desesperando aí, caralho. Pronto, porra. Aí, ó, porra. Hum, ok. Entendi. Pula rápido ali. Cai. Pra cá, desce, esquerda, esquerda, deu igual, deu igual. Boom. Que isso, é o cosmos? Ai, que lindo! É pra descer? Desci. Ui! The York Bonnet. Chegou quase no final. Estamos no final? Mais 40 mob. Gotcha. Got your bitch. Cara, me deu spoiler, cara. Que absurdo. Não tá, não? Agora já era, porra. Que <risos> não é Low, bro. Aí não tá mesmo? Bom, o jogo é curto. Eu, eu, já, eu já tenho ideia que tá. Ou no final, ou quase no final. Porque eu sei que o jogo é curto. E eu joguei ontem umas duas horas. Já tem duas horas de jogo isso aqui. Mas hoje já deve ter aí três horas. Não foi espalha não. Eu já sei, já tenho ideia. Dá pra pular ali? Dá não, pô. Eu 
Joguei mó bonito, né, cara? É relaxante. Eu não vou conseguir chegar. Lilexing. Kinda Lilexing. Pareceu um pinto. Um cubo. Eu preciso ficar segurando? Vou ficar segurando. Ah tá, era uma cantina. E eu segurando o botão de besta. Sendo que é uma cantina. Às vezes jogou me lembra um anime mangá que eu gosto muito. Ou Seiki no Kuni. Não é o Ni no Kuni não, né? Anime da Gemas. Anime 3D. Ixi. Ah, Quest B de novo. 80 monstros. Aí matou os 80, apareceu mais 80. Filhos da puta, cara. Lixos. Por que não bota o total dos monstros? Fucking counts. Pra onde eu vou aqui? Meio. Isso aqui tem terreno? Tem. A musiquinha tá ficando mais intensa. <risos> Um, dois, três, quatro. Eu preciso de mais dois. Eu preciso de mais dois. Eu preciso de mais dois. Opa, onde tá um? Vou me jogar daqui. Hope for the best. Esse Johnny me foi ler o mangá, meu coração foi destruído. Ixi, Maria. Socorro. Eu não sei pra onde eu vou. Deve ser aqui. Pera, eu vim daqui. Shit. Brilhando ali, tem um bagulho brilhando ali. Como que eu chego lá, Dom? Tem algo aqui. Surely. Tem pênis. Aqui no meio? Não. Cosmético. Floresta aqui? Ah. Cheguei, hein? Floresta aqui. Eu vou pra onde? Direita? É. Não, não cai não. 
pra cá. Quer dizer, é aqui mesmo. Aí, ó. Aí, lá o trem. What is that? Uma plataforma... Ah, ok. Plataforma ser ambulante. Valeu, irmão. Tá, preciso de mais um. Let's move. Pra esquerda. Ok. Sobe aqui. Ok. Não dá pra passar. Porque tem que chegar aqui. E agora? Nossa, que pula um. Ah, é o teleporte, cara. Eu tenho que parar de... Nossa senhora. Eu tenho que parar de dar double click em tudo que eu vejo. Usei o teleporte sem querer. Jumento. Ou ainda tava fazendo isso ainda? Eu disse, caramba, cara. Aquele da esquerda? Yep. Não. Não, não. É lá mesmo. Pra cá. O que se faz? Fez. Checkpoint. Não me espera. Ele desce. Bora. Pode ir. Pra direita, né? Ok. Ó, 
Oh! Oh! Aí vem aqui. Vem. Peguei. Peguei o último. Ui! Agora podemos subir. Os passarinhos. Até ele pela esquerda também, né? O jumento. Tanto faz. Tanto faz, na real. Pronto. Bu, 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 bu. Okay, so now what? Yerubu? Completou o caminhão. Mas que que porra é essa? É gira de bêbado? Tô ganhando. Ah, tá. Troca. Tem que fazer de novo. E aí? Vai... Ih, vai ver aquele bicho. Yep. É um novo joguinho NFT da tipo Mir, lançou ontem, da WeMate, esqueci o nome. Que isso, velho? O que, que houve? É o mesmo rosto dela, uma cópia. Comeu. Comi ou não? Me comeram, cara. Que isso?
Apertei sem querer, porra. Sem querer, velho. Aceitação, quinta etapa. Esquerda, esquerda. O jogo sobre os estágios do luto? Sei lá, mano. Será que eu tô entendendo alguma coisa? Não tô entendendo nada, não. Tipo, a gente começa recuperando, a... recuperando cores. Recuperou a cor vermelha, recuperou a cor amarela, azul, blá blá blá. Agora apareceu um, um sinal de quinta etapa. Sei lá que porra é essa. Música final? Música completa. Chupada? Recuperou a cor. Que eu vou lá, meu Jesus Cristo. É Night Crawls. O nome do jogo. Não desce. Do outro ali. Ah, o que aconteceu aqui nesse jogo? Que eu não entendi nada. Hum. 
Não sei. <risos> Só que tá mais difícil de entender a lore do Elder Ring. Ou qualquer, qualquer outro jogo da From Software. Sem ler item nenhum. Completamente cego. Entrei nas nuvens. Acabou. A Game Boy não mata estúdio. Acabou, entendi nada. Acabou, entendi nada. Teve de novo do VAT? Bem lembrado. Eu vi. Eu vi ontem. Eu vi ontem a notificação. Eu falei, ó. Oh, vamos assistir. Acho que dá pra assistir agora. Uma horinha. Uma da manhã. Dá pra assistir agora. Aproveitar que acabou o jogo. Cadê o Oka? Ô, Oka. Tá aí ainda? O que aconteceu nesse jogo aqui? Não entendi nada, mano. Você viu dos dragões? Não. Faltou o, du, os du, o, dos, uh, o dos dragões e outro lá. Tava faltando esses dois vídeos. Aí ele upou mais um novo. Eu deveria assistir o dos dragões antes desse novo? Ou tem nada a ver? Precisa? Maravilha. Olha o personagem. É bobo ou não é? Kinda hot. Kinda hot. As outras clássicas não né? vai ficar brabíssima. Ela começou assim, plebe. Tá assim agora. É, pô. De buba, bro? We need buba. Cara, não consigo abrir o chat, que inferno. Quer dizer, não é que eu consigo não abrir o chat. É que eu não consigo max... Quando você aperta Enter... O chat maximiza e eu consigo ver o histórico. Bom, não tá acontecendo mais. E agora os personagens do Dragon's Dogma 2? Você acha que eu vou jogar aquilo? Tá doido, pô? Não consegui jogar um. Ah, mas o dois é melhor. O dois deve ser melhor. Deve ter organizado melhor, mas... Vou jogar nada, pô. 250 conto. Num jogo full nerd. É, é muito... Dragon's Dragon é muito RPGzão pesado. Não consegui tancar. Não é pra mim. É... Não é que eu não gostei. É que não é pra mim. Sabe? Pra dar pra criar é grátis. Então, mas pra que eu vou criar um personagem? Se eu não vou jogar o jogo? Perder meu tempo? <risos> Thanks for playing Grease no Mother Studio. Entendi nada, mas jogão. Acha muito bonito. Música boa. É o suficiente pra. Pim, termina o jogo. É o suficiente pra achar. Agora você pode carregar o capítulo anterior e exibitar a galera no menu de extras. Ok. Bom, bom. Bom. Bom, pode comprar. Não tem os reviews, né? Eu, eu, mano, eu racho com os reviews na Steam. Os caras colocam um... Aquela imagem pixelada do... Do Shrek. 
Aí com a frasinha, bom, pode comprar. <risos> cara é muito estúpido, mano. Se foder. Os capítulos. Ah, aqui ele fala, ó. Começo, pá, pá, pá. O do quadrado, o da tartaruga. E o último da mão. Nossa. Galeria? Ai, que isso? Que lindo. Oh, o jogo é. Direção de arte desse jogo. Pau champ demais, mano. O Gris concorreu à direção de arte e outras categorias, se não me engano, no Game of... The Game Awards. Não sei de que ano. Não sei se venceu. Mas eu lembro que esse jogo. Eu fiquei sabendo porque ele foi indicado para algumas categorias no The Game Awards. Em algum ano, hein? E o tanto. Tanto das, das pessoas. Falarem sobre ele. Trabalhos não usados? Músicas não usadas? Avalanche. Concluiu. Rastros. E o 32, hein? Tog! Nossa, a quest deu 8% de XP. Acabei de upar e eu tô com 8%. Muitos atributos por 10 minutos. Eu tô cheio desses negócios, né? Mas não vou usar agora, não. Não tô pensando. Ó, pontinho. Inteligência é full dano mágico. Dano técnico, não sei que porra é essa. Eu coloquei um ponto nele. Dano... Aceito dano crítico e dano crítico do longo alcance. Que bizarro, né? Destreza faz isso. E tipo, o meu dono é, é dono de longo alcance. Vai? Right? Isso serve pra mim também. Como é que eu sei que é dano de longo alcance? Ou dano médio, ou... Some shit like that. Isso aqui é claro, igual. Cai na rota. O arqueiro é com certeza o longo alcance, né? Tá repetindo a música. Cadê a Grace? Qual que é essa Grace aqui? Demora pra começar? Acerto mágico. Ah, tem acerto e acerto mágico. Dano crítico e dano crítico mágico. Você é dano de curto alcance? Não, não é interessante. Perseverança. Redução de dano crítico, resistência, é foi redução, se foda. Mana. Velocidade de conjuro. Isso é interessante. Vida. Cara, sem certeza é interessante. Castar mais rápido as spells? Mano, mano. Eu vou full dano, se foda. Tô oh, dando macho. Olha ali, eu achei. Tá, bora.
Cara, me deu uma dor de barriga agora, meu amigo. Socorro. Nossa senhora. Acho que vou ter que ir ali, velho. <risos> Eu acho que vou ter que ir ali. Vou botar na categoria Crypto. Vou botar uma musiquinha. Enquanto eu vou ali, doido. Vou botar um Plim Plim Plim. <risos> Urgente Houve um, uma urgência Sorry Pera aí
Hello, what the? Opa! No matter how far, no matter how far. Vai, porra. E onde é que eu tô? Tô saindo parado, não pode não. Pss, pss. Chop, chop. E aí, Frederico? Que calor do cap. Bruco. Caraca, o cara fez arma aí, pô. A gata tá usando. A gata tá funcionando. A porra do chat? Filho da puta! Quando eu fechei a porra do Gris. e eu tô com. A gata tá funcionando essa pica. Eu tô mais mal. Rapaz, deu uma leveza agora. E não sei. Deu uma leveza. Olha, tu não tá ligado. Uf, me sinto outra pessoa. <risos> Quase morri pra cagar hoje, bosta tava duro. <risos> Olha o que o cara fala, velho. <risos> Saiu rasgando o rabo, hã? Huh? Saiu rasgando, fala tu. Hã? É? I know how you feel, hein? Saiu como? Rasgando. E não doeu? Mas eu tô rindo porque eu sei também qual, qual que é a sensação, ok? Então, yeah, to todos nós sofremos disso, dude. It's ok, it's ok. It's fine. Ah, uh, tá. Vamos... Vamos ver o videozinho? Bora! The Lord of Elder Ring is Cursed. No vídeo do Vati. Deixa eu abrir aqui. Esse joguinho é o Night Crawls. Night Crawls. É o novo jogo da Wii Made, um joguinho NFT. Lançou ontem. Aí tu deixa automático aí. Tá ligado? Tô deixando no alto aí pra ver se dá algum dinheiro. Dá uma grana, sei lá. Como vai ter manutenção... O povo deve ter ido dormir. A manutenção é até que horas? A vez de manutenção, temporária. A manutenção temporária está generada para quarta-feira, 13 de março, às 13 horas. Para mais anos. 13 de março, às 13 horas? Ah, tá, tá longe, porra. Nem vou estar acordado. Tre... Mentira, 13 horas, estou acordado. Vai ser às as... 13. Às 13. Uh, deixa eu mudar a categoria Eu não vou botar de achar não Vou botar o ring Pra beitar as pessoas Brinks Burning The Dancing Esqueci de fazer um negócio eu tô com um filtro aqui, ah não, em games, né? É. Tá com um filtro, tá com um filtro. O cara que jogo esse estúpido. Bom, tirei. Ah, não entendi, a manutenção às 13. Eu 
करते हैं मंत्रेश्वर आज दोस Os caras já não estão farmando nível 39 ali, hein? Filhos da puta. Uma ou duas? Não, porque é uma e meia agora, né? Então. Ele falou, ah, é agora. É agora a manutenção, então deve ser duas, não é? Tá, deixa eu ir. Para de rolar. Cadê a porra do vídeo? Eu preciso colocar o jogo não precisa jogar e ganhar dinheiro. Ele não precisa jogar mais ou menos, né? Caramba, quanta coisa que eu peguei aqui. Mais ou menos. Ah, a maioria é automática? A maioria é automática. Pode deixar batendo? Pode deixar batendo. Mas pra você progredir mesmo, tem que fazer um bocado de coisa. Pega aí, porra. O que é isso aqui? Tá no macho. Eu tô pensando como é que eu vou fazer pra... Eu teria que colocar esse jogo na outra tela. No caso do React. Can I do that? Like... A janela e puxou pra cá. Ah! Ah! Aí, ó, porra. Pronto, that works. Not fucking works, bro. Se eu botar a tela cheia, ok, a tela cheia fica aqui. Não, mas é melhor. Pera aí. É abrir o Dark Souls 3, guys. Brinks. Só um minuto. Ok. Eu preciso entrar no outro canal lá, né? Pins. Ok, bora. Vou assistir esse lixo. A música é uma emissão. Sorry, vamos ver o vídeo. The Lord of Elder Ring is cursed. 
Up until last week, we didn't know much about the DLC. In fact, we knew... <laughs> but now we know that the DLC entrance is here, in Mogwin Palace, before <laughs> Nicholas Withered Arm. I think it could be important to understand the circumstances of Mikola's death here at the hands of Moog, so let's dive in. Onos. As the age of the Erd Tree began, Moog was born of the union between Queen Marika and Lord Godfrey. Godfrey was the first Elden Lord. As such, Moog is one of the oldest demigods, alongside <laughs> his siblings, who were Morgoth and Godwin. Moog and Morgoth were twins, born together and born as Omen, Together, placing them in stark contrast to their brother Godwin, who was the golden child, so to speak. Omen, like Moog and Morgoth, on the other hand, were considered to be cursed. But what are the Omen? Skip this chapter if you've heard it all before, but I think the omen are born by chance, sprouting these grotesque horns that are vestiges of the primordial crucible. So what is the crucible? The crucible is a melting pot of life that existed before the Erd Tree, and its energies are actually what became the Erd Tree. It's here that there was this blending of many creatures' physiological aspects, like Feathers, tail, knot, scale, fang, and horn. What's truly noteworthy about these aspects is that they would sometimes come to grow on creatures that weren't supposed to have them. For example, kill a deer or sheep or even an ancestral follower in the lands between and there's a tiny chance that you'll receive a budding horn, which I think are not unlike the horns of the omen. Oh, what fuck? The budding horn Thanks, reads, you know? This horn began to sprout on a beast that yes, typically bears more horn. Perhaps bear? it is a vestige of the primordial crucible. According to the crucible talismans, Yo, there was a time rage. when these aspects we were, up like rage horns, were once Como considered estamos? signifiers of the divine. And, Buti, and that makes some sense because live. these well, aspects stem from the crucible which did become region. the Erd Tree, so why wouldn't o they be considered da Lord da holy? And so it's during this time Just that we have chilling. to assume that the ancient warriors known Peak as ring, the Crucible paga. Knights were knighted, serving Lord Godfrey and fighting with many aspects of the Crucible, <gasps> including no horn, gamba, tail, cara. Que breath, isso, pô? and even wings. But fast gamba, forward gamba. to the current age and the Crucible Knights are lost, tá scattered cara, né, all gacha. over the lands between, Surely. fighting for different causes or for no então, cause at all. And that's because Queen Marika's golden order ah, the Crucible Gauntlets tail. reveal that in time, elements. the strength shown by these knights in their appearance came to be looked upon with scorn for having such close resemblance to Acho chaos. Também. This matches a wider trend in Marika's golden order where things were moving away from chaos and the Crucible and even the Erd Tree and towards ah, tá, okay. fundamentalism instead but fast the age of the earth tree progressed but the crucible knights zinha. got off easy ai 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 game take these creatures for example previously they were seen as divine for having aspects of the crucible at birth but eventually they came to be called misbegotten também depois o suborno de gifts mas a really cabeça de ano these were now seen <laughs> as contemptible <laughs> creatures bearing ill-gotten gains the misbegotten Tal became vez. seen as <laughs> impure, a fact revealed by the spirit ashes Bela of Tentativa. the Tricia, who was a healer who dedicated her efforts to treating misbegotten and the omen as well. The omen and the misbegotten gamas? certainly needed treatment, as many of them suffered these grievous é wounds possível, as a result of their horns being cut off. Those responsible for these wounds in particular were the omen killers, a sect of Landell butchers who had full authority to hunt the omen and amputate their horns. So, in my opinion, the tradition of cutting off omen horns would have begun because horns are the offending part Fazendo of the omen, as puta merda, as they represent their link to the primordial crucible, which Imagina is something fazer o que that became this accursed concept. And 
omen do bear more aspects of the crucible than just horns. Moog has a set of wings, just like the Misbegotten, and Morgoth might as well, though they're only really rigged in his animation files. Instead, Morgoth has a tail, just like the Crucible Knights. All that said, the defining aspect of the omen oh, are definitely answer? the horns. That and their brute strength were enough to label them as omen, distinct from the Misbegotten, but still born by chance though many omen were apparently born directly from the Erd Tree's royal line. Two of the darkest items in the game are the Omen Bairn and the Regal Omen Bairn. The word Bairn means child, and these items are dolls. They're fetishes that were fashioned to memorialize omen children who are dead, or who might as well be. The Omen Bairn's description reads, Omen babies have all their horns excised causing most to perish, and those that survive live alongside those memorialized by the regal Omen Bairn, which reads, Omen babies born of royalty do not have their horns excised, but instead are kept underground, unbeknownst to anyone, imprisoned for eternity. Well, so, some chifrin, concessions pô. were made for Omen, Só as opposed to the chifres, misbegotten, pô. Two Omen children, Moog and Morgoth, were after all a part of the Golden Lineage, so the Royal Omens weren't mutilated, as long as their horns were out of mind and out of sight. And speaking of sight, a horn seems to be responsible for Moog literally being half blind, as it has grown relentlessly into well, his eye socket. Ele... Incidentally, there's a bit of a trend with well, blind um characters olho, não, in Elden Ring and in other From Software games as well, and it's o that those blinded dele, are ironically olhos. able to see what sighted folk what cannot. The hell? For example, in Elden Ring, it was the exiled prophets who accurately foresaw the flame of ruin burning down the Erd Tree, and it was the guilty, their eyes gouged by thorns, who glimpsed an outer god in the darkness. There are lots of examples, so I guess coincidentally or not, Olá. Moog, half blind and wounded, eventually did come to stand before an outer god of his own as well. well. And he met her deep underground. This outer god was called the Formless Mother and the Mother of Truth, a fitting choice for the omen whose true mother had abandoned him. Hmm. The formless mother. We've talked about outer gods in other videos, but long story short, they're these cosmic Lovecraftian entities that are at once extremely powerful, but also strangely limited in how they can influence events in the lands between. Instead of getting involved directly, they will often commune through envoys or vessels, and in the case of the formless mother, her subject of communion, one of them at least, was Moog. The Blood Boon incantation describes Moog's meeting with this outer god. It reads, The Mother of Truth craves wounds. When Moog stood before her, deep underground, his accursed blood erupted with fire, and he was besotted with the defilement that he was born into. The text also describes what happens when mm. you cast this incantation. You thrust your arm into the body of the formless mother, then scatter the blood flame to set the area ablaze. Oh. So, there's a lot to break down with this one description. But let's start with the fact that this outer god is at once both the formless mother and the mother of truth. Mm. So what exactly do these titles mean? Let's start with the Formless Mother, because I feel like that I'm title is form, easier to rationalize. She is likely formless because liquid blood is her essence. And incidentally, the word formless is also used to describe the Dragon Communion Seal in Elden Ring, which is also made of blood. But let's cast our net beyond Elden Ring to Bloodborne where Bloodborne. an extremely relevant parallel to the Formless Mother exists in the character of Formless Erden, which is also an outer god of sorts. The Erden Carol rune states that blood is the essence of the Formless Great One, Erden, and 
While I absolutely think that the universes of Bloodborne and Elden Ring are separate, I'm confident that From Software are reusing a concept from Bloodborne here in Elden Ring. So it is that I'm confident that blood is also the essence of the Formless Mother. That said, the Formless Mother still has a body of sorts. We thrust our arm cross-dimensionally into it when we cast Blood Boon, and when we rip our arm out, we scatter not just blood, but blood flame. Thus, while I think the Formless Mother absolutely has an affinity for any blood, I think her essence is, more accurately, blood flame. And she's not the only outer god with a flame of her own. The Fell God has Giant's Flame. The giant. Death has Black Flame and Ghost Flame. Frenzy has Frenzy Flame, and you could even theorize that the Greater Will has the golden fire that spews from the mouth of the Elden Beast and Placidious Axe. So, flame is Plus commonly a sign of an outer god's essence, and I think the Formless Mother is no different, with a blood flame that continues to threaten rupture on those afflicted long after it touches their flesh. The Formless Mother's other title is the Mother of Truth, and this title is a lot harder to interpret. The Mother of Truth. What truth? The only character that we know of that the Mother of Truth has appeared before is Moog, so we're kind of forced to judge her character through his. And while I guess it's possible that the Mother of Truth venerates the absolute truth, or a broader truth, the fact that she chooses to act through Moog is at least a little bit telling. We know that she bestows power upon accursed blood, and I think this preference for accursed blood might be a part of the truth that she represents. I think she might prefer to act through those who are unfairly cursed, like the Omen, like Moog. Mm. And I say unfairly cursed because that's kind of what curses are always in From Software games. Curses are always the domain of the gods, and they're always delivered pretty heavy-handedly. Take Dark Souls, for example, yep. where Gwyn, mm -hmm. a god, refused to relinquish his Age of Fire, opting instead to curse humanity with undeath, so that they might fuel his fire until the world turns to ash. Pretty over the top, right? And Queen Marika is actually very similar to Gwyn, in that she's a god who arrogantly thinks her order is perfect, to the point where she'll do anything to try and preserve it. Her hubris is alluded to in the Mending Rune of Perfect Order description, which states that the current imperfection of the Golden Order, or instability of ideology, can be blamed upon the fickleness of the gods no better than men. And it's this same hubris that led to the scorn of the Crucible, and I think the curse upon the Omen as well. To make things even more unfair for the Omen, their curse appears to largely be one of perception, of hate. The Omen Bairn description conflates these two things, and speaks from the perspective of an Omen child who pleads, please don't hate me, or curse me, please. I also think this notion of curses being unfair is explored further in the Dung Eaters questline, where the Dung Eater goes I'll around do defiling others and spreading the omen curse. He calls this defilement his cursed blessing, because if he defiles everyone, in the end, everyone will be cursed, and therefore no one will be. Thus, in his ending, a sort of cursed justice is restored to the world. Elden Ring has this consistent theme where characters turn their curse into their strength, and I think the Dung Eater and Moog are perfect examples of that. And this is just my theory, but I think the Mother of Truth might bestow power upon the accursed because the truth is that curses of the gods are unfairly given. There should be nothing wrong with being born with omen horns, right? Yeah, man. It's just this genetic trait, a vestige of the primordial crucible that was once even considered divine. But thanks to the Golden Order, these creatures are now considered omens instead. So I'd like to argue that 
this unfairness is why the Mother of Truth bestows power upon accursed blood. But of course, this is just my theory and I welcome any challenges to it in the comments. I think challenging each other respectfully is how we can get a bit closer to the truth. Speaking of, I saw arguments ages ago that stated that the formless mother is responsible for the curse of the omen. But I'd like to challenge that idea. I'm not sure it can be correct. For one, it's stated that Moog first stood before the formless mother underground, and he was only down here because he was already banished here for being omen, yeah. so he must have been omen before this meeting. What's more, when he did stand before her, it's stated that his accursed blood erupted with fire. Thus, his blood was already accursed when it erupted with fire. Finally, it says Moog was besotted with the defilement that he was born into. Thus, he was born Omen, like all of the other Omen children, born to be shunned in a wretched mire underground. But I think there's a reason that people argue that the Formless Mother created the Omen, and I think one of the arguments is that Morgoth, Moog's brother, also has blood flame attacks, just like his brother. So yeah. I think people reason that Blood flame is therefore synonymous with having accursed blood and that all omen have it. But that's not true, because only Moog and Morgoth seem to have blood that was set ablaze. It's clear Moog's was set ablaze in item descriptions, and it's clear Morgoth weaponized his own flaming blood by recanting it, but no other omen fight with blood flame. So I reckon they both received this blood flame from the Formless Mother. I think the Formless Mother appeared before not just Moog, but Morgoth as well, even though that's never mentioned. Only difference was Moog embraced this power and Morgoth spurned it. Indeed, Morgoth only uses blood flame against us in his boss fight as a last resort. Morgoth's blood flame became a cursed sword that reads, Weapon of Shifting Hue used by Morgoth, the Omen King. The accursed blood that Morgoth recanted and sealed away reformed into this blade. For him to have this, I think, proves that it wasn't just Moog that was approached by the Formless Mother, it was Morgoth as well. They were both underground, assumedly sealed in the same place after all, so I think both of them had their accursed blood set aflame. I think the Mother of Truth, like so many other outer gods attempted to influence a demigod, and I think they failed with Morgoth, but succeeded with Moog. Yep. In the end, both <clears throat> Moog and Morgoth weaponized their trauma. For Moog, we can look at the Cursed Blood Pot, for example, which you throw at enemies to douse them in accursed blood, causing summoned spirits to assail them with a rabid fervor, a childhood memory of the Lord of Blood. It's basically saying that Moog remembers being attacked for his accursed blood as a child, and considering the blood specifically motivates spirits to attack, it might be referencing Moog's experience of being haunted by evil spirits. According to the Omen Smirk Mask, evil spirits haunt the Omen in their nightmares, so with this cursed blood pot, now Moog could give others a similar experience. The Mother of Truth craves wounds. She desires bloodshed, swarm of flies, blood boon, blood flame. Everything to do with her is designed to let the blood flow. So the Mother of Truth's base desires are quite simple. But does she want more? Where do her goals end and where do Moog's begin? Well, beyond specifically wanting to empower the accursed, and beyond craving bloodshed, the Mother of Truth doesn't seem to want much. Take Moog's Sacred Spear, for example. It's called an instrument of communion with an outer god, and all it seems to do is pierce the Formless Mother, coating the blade in her blood flame. Okay. That's it. That's the communion. What's more, this sacred spear is a design that will come to symbolize his dynasty. Not the Formless Mother's dynasty, Moog's dynasty. 
the formless mother might enable this, but at the end of the day, she is behind Moog's dynasty, but she's not the face of it. So the most you could say, I think, is that she has ambition, yes, but she's not interested in being this god that's worshipped. I think that's very fitting for an outer god, actually. Instead, it's Moog's ambition that we should talk about. And it's Moog's ambition that led him to leave the sewers long ago. The Probably as ambition. soon as he could overpower the shackles that bound him here. This battle you have down here with Moog is actually with an omen illusion. Not unlike the fight that you have with Morgoth's illusion. Omen have this ability to conjure illusions. We can sort of infer that from the soundtrack, which calls them omen illusions. Morgoth uses his illusion to hinder the tarnished. Mm -hmm. yep. His is pretty easy to understand, but it's kind of hard to understand why Moog's illusion is down here in the sewers. Moog's true location is a bit of a mystery, so maybe he put the illusion here to throw trackers off the scent and sort of pretend that he was still in the sewers? Or did he leave it here to prevent access to the frenzied flame? Because his brother Morgoth does something similar down here after all. This illusion of Moog might even be conjured up by Morgoth because I just noticed that it seems to erupt into golden particles when it's defeated. Still, it's impossible to know for sure. Anyway, mm. nearby you can find an omen shackle. These shackles have lost most of their power now, and indeed Moog has long escaped the sewers, and not even the all-knowing knows where to find him. But he's here, somewhere underneath the land of Caled, a so-called Lord of Blood, who rules in the ruins of an ancient civilization, which he has decided will be the seat of his coming dynasty. Right. Dynasty. This place is drenched in blood, swarming with Moog's servants, and the crumbling palace itself is awash with the formless mother's blood flame. But it was not always this way. The map of Mogwin Palace reads, In the lightless depths lies the cave of an ancient civilization. It is here Mog, the Lord of Blood, is building his palace, to be the seat of his coming dynasty, named Mogwin. So this ancient Mogwin. civilization existed long before Mog. What was this place? This ancient dynasty isn't given a name but everything here should look very familiar. The underground woodland evokes the one found in Shifra. The statues depict the same bearded figure as the statues in Uld and Ul. These are the remains of an ancient dynasty that can be found all over the lands between. And Moog has very intentionally started to build his dynasty on the remains of their own. Moog calling his rule a dynasty is intentionally evocative of the ancient dynasty. We know about this ancient dynasty because of the oracle bubbles, which are the sorceries of the claymen who served as priests in the ancient dynasty. The description goes on to state, the claymen search for lost oracles within their bubbles. And there's a whole video to be had on this topic, so I won't go too deep into this for now, especially since their culture doesn't really seem relevant to Moog at all. Because I don't think Moog is intent on reviving the old dynasty or continuing it. Rather, item descriptions stress that his is a new dynasty. And if there's anything from the old dynasty that he does use, like the architectural remains of the palace or even possibly the antiquated Latin that he speaks. I feel he might be trying to evoke the old dynasty because he might have envied how widespread the old dynasty was. And I think he wants his dynasty to have this Latin. air of legitimacy, something it sorely lacks at the moment. Moog's new dynasty is very different from the old. The swarm of flies in Cantation sums it up well and reads, the new palace of the Lord of Blood lies in a swamp of festering blood. 
These flies can be cast as a Blood Oath incantation, which are spells directly linked to Moog's own power. But aside from the incantation, these flies also spawn from the blood-tainted excrement that you can loot in this area, which contain dense columns and sanguine. tiny eggs of unknown but assuredly revolting origin. The roped fly pot elaborates, stating, The maggots found in waste feed on blood and turn into vicious flies that are pitiably short-lived. Their fangs inflict countless lacerations on the victim while the grating sound of their wings assails their sanity. And specifically, these flies spawn from the excrement of carnivorous beasts, of which there are now many in the new dynasty, all festering with these bloody pustules and being even tougher than their kin on the surface. So, yeah, not a great place. And yet, many disenfranchised <laughs> beings Discussion still over. seem to choose to reside here, soaking in the festering blood swamp. Which brings us to the Albinorix here. Albinorix. Way, the Albinorix themselves have accursed blood, not unlike the Omen. The Albinorix blood clot reads, Albinorix are life forms made by human hands. Thus, many believe them to live impure lives, untouched by the Erd Tree's grace. Now, this is just my own speculation, but we know that the formless mother bestows power upon accursed blood, so do you think maybe it's fitting that of all the creatures in this blood-soaked land, many of the Albinorix have found a way to weaponize the blood? I think they've accepted Moog's tainted blood quite well. The red Albinorix stand apart from their silver kin, who sit dejectedly upon the cliff face. The red ones patrol the area and fight with attacks that are actually unique from every other Albinoric in the game. Yep. Even their model is a little bit unique, beyond just being red. Look at their heads and you'll see these oh, tiny little Omen horns sprouting. Oh, Personally, I believe this is because they've been soaking in blood. Specifically, I think they've been tainted by Moog's own What? Blood. We know from the Seedbed Curse icon and the Dung Eater questline that it's possible to spread omen horns, or at least that horns are an aspect of a defilement that can be spread. So I think that explains why they're sprouting horns here. And there is also evidence that reveals Moog was attempting to share his accursed blood with others. This leads us to Vare and the war surgeons who were abducted by Moog, who I'm wanted sorry. to see if they could tame the accursed blood. Quattro. As you enter the Mogwan Palace grounds, three white-robed invaders assail you, one after the other. These are the nameless white masks, and they kind of have fascinating lore to speak of. The white masks wear the war surgeon gown, which marks them as war surgeons, who were effectively mercy killers. The dagger talisman elaborates, stating that the white-garbed field surgeons come to the aid of friend and foe alike by dealing a final deadly thrust to spare them from the prolonged agony of a mortal wound. So their name is a bit misleading, as there isn't really any surgery occurring here that could save someone's life. Their favorite weapon is the Misericord, Misericord. A dagger with a name that translates to <laughs> mercy, and it reads, Dagger favored by military physicians in white, medicine is mercy, and mercy upon the battlefield is ruthless. The White Mask's weapon is found in a storage quarter of Stormvale, and their talisman is found in Volcano Manor, so it's kind of difficult to say which faction they served, if any. After all, they delivered death equally to friend and foe, so they were probably a common sight on the battlefields of the Shattering, regardless of their allegiance. Their choice of white clothing is curious as well. In war, white is the color of truce, which is appropriate for these somewhat neutral characters, and incidentally, I think white also shows bloodstains a lot more starkly, and maybe mm -hmm. that's why the color yeah. was chosen as well. These characters definitely got their hands dirty as they delivered their mercy, but constantly delivering mercy 
would eventually cause them to turn depraved. The dagger talisman ends with the line, a sense of mercy is a catalyst for bloodlust, and their weapon warns one to beware the killers clothed as men of compassion. So the war surgeons inevitably developed this taste for blood, and it was this very fact that eventually led to them being targeted and abducted by Moog. The war surgeon gown reads, of the surgeons that were abducted by the Lord of Blood, none were able to tame the accursed blood, none but Vare, that is, though he was an exception. Therefore, the war surgeons, these nameless white masks that assail you in Mogwin Palace, ended up here because they were unexpectedly abducted by the Lord of Blood. This reveals that Moog was searching for potentates who might be able to control the accursed blood that he had been graced with. It's more proof that he was looking to share his accursed blood with others. And considering these surgeons now invade on behalf of Moog, it seems clear that they were happy on some level okay, to well. have this new violent outlet for their bloodlust. Yeah, this... Though only one of their number actually horas, manages não, to tame the accursed Morinha. blood as Moog decided, that's Vare. But what does that really mean? to tame the accursed blood. Well, earlier we speculated that the Albanorix are growing horns because they've been doused not just in blood, but in Moog's accursed omen blood. And I really do think that there's a lot of evidence that Moog is trying to find worthy recipients that contain his essence. Because instead of the phrase tame the accursed blood, the original Japanese actually says something closer to accept. The Muito obrigado. Blood, which brings me to this interaction with Vare, Anisada. where he gives you a wound, Thank you. and you accept what is assumedly Give me your finger. This noble blood will be an immutable badge of honor once oh. it settles Traduz inside desse. of you. Oh, good heavens! Clench your teeth or something. The bloody finger item, which is bloody your finger, finger, I might add, reads, Glistening blood has been siphoned into the nail of this skin. Its sickly horas, pale cara. skin feels nothing now, but the nail dez. still aches Good. with the sweetest pain. Eu não sei do Never que está forget falando. that feeling of agony, for it is what binds you to Luminary Moog, to all of us. <laughs> with a fresh infusion of this accursed, noble blood, you can invade other tarnished and sate your bloodlust, materializing out of blood in other worlds, just like Moog does. But that's not the only way that you can invade with what is assumedly Moog's blood. Oh. You can also do so with a festering bloody finger. These are consumable items and Vare is hoping that you'll use these to fuel a bloodlust of your own thereby distracting you from the allure of the two fingers who have other plans for you as a tarnished. But if you prove this bloodlust to Vare, you'll be inducted into Jesus, their world. You'll what? have blood infused into you, perhaps oh, no. as he and other war surgeons once received. Hmm. I knew it from the very start. You have a taste for noble blood. As opposed to the bloody finger you can receive, these consumable literalmente geral do no YouTube. Então, o o Vat, o, o cara que, que faz esses vídeos que eu assisto, ele tem uma playlist que tem várias vários vídeos é, cortados por parte. Eu não sei quantas horas que dá a todos. Eu assisti a, a maioria da playlistzinha de Lord of the Ring. Mas ele faz mais ou menos isso por parte. Tipo, meia hora de vídeo, uma hora de vídeo, por, por tópicos. Agora esse cara fez um videozão falando sobre tudo. Claro que deve ter os tópicos, né? Pra separar, senão vai ficar desorganizado. 
Mas sobre Lord da Ring, eu costumo ver só do Vart mesmo. Que aparentemente é o melhor que tem. Festering bloody fingers are blackened with blood congestion. And if you look closely, what looked like omen horns appear to be writhing at the end, reinforcing the idea again that it's Moog's accursed blood that had been injected into these fingers before they were cut off. The description goes on to state that these festering fingers have been chopped off rather unceremoniously. The lack of ceremony indicates a measure of disappointment with the owner of these fingers, I think. And that's why I think these fingers once belonged to other inductees, just like the nameless war surgeons who failed to accept the infusion of Moog's blood. Note this dialogue from Vare if you deny him. You will die nameless without ceremony. So the nameless war surgeons are likely also those whose fingers were unceremoniously chopped off, it seems. There, a warning of what could happen to you if you listen to Vare's speech, which is enticing in its splendor, but full of deadly consequence. Despite this harsh treatment of his subjects, Moog is different to the Two Fingers, according to Vare, at least, and one of the key differences, apparently, is love. In his dialogue, Vare laments that the Two Fingers have no love for the Tarnished, but Moog does, he says. Incidentally, the Tarnished are kind of related to Moog via Godfrey, in a way. We're all of the same bloodline, so I guess it is true that we are at least somewhat alike. Vare really is very loyal to Moog, and indeed amongst all the war surgeons, Vare is actually the only one that's capable of encanting Blood Flame Blade, a spell that coats his weapon with what we know is the essence of the Formless Mother. Vare has been granted strength beyond any other character in Moog's dynasty, it seems, and Vare is, no doubt, eventually very disappointed in you when you teleport to the palace early, before the new dynasty has even begun. This is what leads to an optional confrontation with Vare yep. and his death. Oh, luminary Moog, oh. <laughs> please grant the strength you promised. I have given everything. You can teleport to Mogwin Palace early with the Pure Blood Knight's Medal, which is something Vare gives you if you prove yourself to him. I've gone out of my way to provide one to you. But you mustn't use it just yet. The meeting must wait until the Moguin dynasty commences. Luminary Moog yet slumbers Luminary Moog. beside the divinity. Now that we've been inducted, we start to see Moog's luminary <laughs> vision. <laughs> to learn how Moguin dynasty is supposed to come about. The Lord of Blood's exaltation talisman explains, reading. Render up your offerings of blood to your lord. Drench my consort's chamber. Slake his cocoon's thirst. His awakening shall herald the dawn of our dynasty. So he's specifically saying that others should make offerings to Mikla. And I think the ones he's telling to make the offerings would be his bloody fingers. By invading and killing, I think we might just be making offerings of others. And I think also these offerings would be made by the Sanguine Nobles, who are just as aggressive as the Bloody Fingers are if you find them out in the open world. For example, this is one of many Sanguine Nobles, and you fight them here at the Rose Church in Leonia. Yep. It's likely named after the Blood Rose, which is an item deeply related to all things bloody. And the building itself is a sort of parish it's a church that operates in a foreign land, and it's no coincidence that it's here that Vare attempts to recruit you. In fact, the enemy inside the church is supposedly a recruiter as well, although I kind of question their recruiting techniques. 
A então. sanguine noble hood is worn by nobles who serve the Lord of Blood and Algo reads, bem parecido com o do from pools of blood, these assassins are missionaries, come to share the gospel of accursed blood. Just like the Red Albanorix, the Sanguine Nobles have started to grow omen horns, é, and their rank também. seems to exceed that of the Albanorix, as can be inferred by the noble in Mogwin Palace, who stands before a crowd of Albanorix. Again, rather than being chifre. true omen, I think, this is another instance where being infused with Mog's accursed blood has led to their horns growing. Cursed blessing, as the dung eater would say. Their robes go on to read: the grand metallic pattern on the shoulder is a signifier of the noble rank they intend to claim upon the advent of the new dynasty they are working to install. And their weapons are designed to rip the flesh with sickening efficacy, suggesting that they really are working to install this new dynasty via the blood loss of others making offerings for Mikola's cocoon. And cocoon. again, I think the Bloody Fingers are the same way. Yura calls the Bloody Fingers tarnished, held in thrall by cessblood, zealots who stalk their own. If it isn't Narius, the Bloody Finger, the end is nigh for you. Yura is familiar with many such Bloody Fingers, none more so than Eleonora, who is the one he loves, and she's the Leonora. one who he considers to be the deadliest bloody finger of all. I'm dying to see you, Eleonora. Violet bloody finger. In the end, though, Eleonora kills Yura here at the second church Eleonora. of Marica. And this church is interesting, because despite being a church of Marica, there's clearly been an attempt by Moog's adherents to usurp it. Note the blood roses, the sanguine noble who appears here, the hound here festering with blood, and of course Eleonora herself. Eleonora is one of Moog's bloody fingers, the most dangerous of them all, if Yura is to be believed. Perhaps it's for this reason that Moog might have entrusted her with the purifying crystal tear, an item that can nullify the effect of Moog's Rite of Blood attack. Either that, or she has somehow procured this purifying crystal tear because she has a secret plan oh, to attack Moog. Yeah. You could Sarah? definitely speculate in that direction as well, I think, if you wanted to. Eleonora wields a twinned Naginata, a weapon that's forged in the land of Essa Reeds, quebrada, which is a place locked in civil war, Mas é legal that também. has become alienated from the culture of its neighbors. Little wonder, it is said, that the entire nation has succumbed to blood-soaked madness. It's on this note that I'd again like to return to the description of Bloodborne. Formless Erden in Bloodborne, specifically the part that says both Erden and Erden's inadvertent worshippers surreptitiously seek the precious blood. Earlier, we established that Erden and the Formless Mother clearly have some overlap, and I speculate that this overlap could extend to Erden's inadvertent worshippers as well. Inadvertent means unintentional or accidental worship in this context, and I think that the Formless Mother might have many many children, because I think you can make a good case for her having many inadvertent worshippers of her own. After all, the blood-soaked madness of the Land of Reeds has led more than one of their number directly Okina. to Moog. Introducing Okina, who is a demon of a swordsman. His bloodlust led him into combat with Moog himself, and his sword tells of this story, stating, When Moog, the Lord of Blood, first felt Okina's sword and madness upon his flesh, he had a proposal to offer Okina the life of a demon, whose thirst would never go unsated. So it was that Okina became a bloody finger of Moog, cutting down his enemies with rivers of blood. Rivers of blood, sword, oh, which has felled countless men. 
Weapons like these are really powerful when paired with the Lord of Blood's Exaltation what Talisman, which gives you an attack boost if blood loss is triggered in the vicinity. And one amazing little lore detail is that this Captain of Godric actually gets the attack power buff whenever there's blood loss nearby, hinting that he's oh. actually carrying the Lord of Blood's Exaltation Talisman and that he is thus an adherent of oh. Mog. The weapon mm. art he uses, Bloody Slash, also Bloody suggests slash. as much as it is a Blood Oath skill it granted what I got. by the Lord of Blood. So it seems this Stormvale captain has either defected or is secretly loyal to Moog, or he has a dual allegiance. I love that it's that left such. open to your interpretation. The talisman itself is dropped by Esgar, a priest of blood found in the catacombs below Lane Dell, the same place where Moog first met the Mother of Truth. He wears the robes of an adherent of Moog, except for his great hood, which you. reads a burial shroud of sorts for those who discover, at long last, the truth they sought. I think this could be hinting that Esgar found the Mother of Truth here below, but it's hard to say for sure. Speaking of which, it's unclear if Moog has ever shared the fact that he communes with the Formless Mother at all. Most worship of her appears to be really indirect, and bloodshed for the sake of bloodshed seems reason enough for her and those that perform it as well. Perhaps it's for this reason that the All-Knowing casts doubt on Moog's title, calling him the so-called Lord of Blood. Oh, so that's where the so-called Lord of Blood was hiding himself, eh? Perhaps this lack of clarity about Moog's rule is why even item descriptions cast doubt on Moog, who is the reigning Lord and Hierarch of the coming dynasty of Mogwin, or perhaps a raving lunatic. Sure? After all, can blood offerings really lead to the awakening of Mikola? The remembrance of the Blood Lord does state that no matter how much of his bloody bedchamber he tried to share, he received no response from the young Empyrean. But Moog needs Mikola to awaken. Because Moog doesn't just want to be a ruler, he wants legitimacy in the eyes of the world. And since Mikola is an Empyrean eligible to be the god of this world, he could give Mogwen a legitimacy that might match even the Golden Order, which is structured in a similar way. It has a lord and a god at the forefront. So it's time to finally talk about Mikola, for if he does awaken, then it's very likely that this will lead to the coming dynasty named Mogwen, and whatever nightmares that may bring. Queen Quay. Whatever well, nightmares Mikola that may bring me? is an extremely ominous line, especially considering Mikola has a dreaming alter ego. So to explain that quickly, like many other characters in the game, Mikola has a duality to his Saint character. Trina. On one hand, you have Mikola, the unalloyed who helped his sister resist the effects of the Scarlet Rot, who grew a home for the low and the meek, and who is cursed with eternal youth. But then, on the other hand, Mikola is also Saint Trina, a mysterious character that has powers relating to sleep and dreams. The symbol of their faith is this, Trina's Lily which dulls the senses, preventing agitation. And it's no coincidence that this lily is shaped just like Mikola's lily, for the nascent Mikola is Saint Trina, or they're moonlighting as them in their dreams, so to speak. And whatever Saint Trina has been doing, it's made a really good impression on a great many people. The Lands Between is a pretty harrowing place, after all, and to get relief, it seems, some people have <laughs> turned <laughs> to Saint Trina, whose lilies help them get away from it all. Priests of Saint Trina also exist, crafting sleep arrows to spread their teachings. The sweet oblivion of sleep can become quite the habit. Another such item is the sleep pot, which says, like a lullaby or a quagmire 
its light purple haze irresistibly draws its victims down into sleep. Sweet dreams. Incidentally, I mean me. the word lullaby brings to mind another piece of cut content to do with Mikola, where the red-eyed merchants were once taught the song that they play in their tomb by a mysterious figure. And fittingly, St. Trina's full cut name is St. Trina of the Cradle Song which connects them to the merchant's song. In mm -hmm. Cut Merchant Dialogue, it's stated that the one who sang for them now sings no longer. The singer is missing, just like Saint Trina, because the one who sang was Saint Trina. And we don't really have to just rely on Cut content to tell us of that fact. An item called Favor's Cookbook suggests that Saint Trina is missing as well as it is a record of crafting techniques left by a man who was utterly captivated by St. Trina. He continued the search for her in his slumber. So he was searching for her because St. Trina went missing. Also, St. Trina's sword reads, St. Trina is an enigmatic figure. Some say she is a comely young girl. Others are sure he is a boy. The only certainty is that their appearance was as sudden as their disappearance. So St. Trina went missing. And returning to cut dialogue, we also learn about a character called Rico, a Rico. cut NPC who claims to be Mikola's humble servant, and who we believe finds Mikola's body at Moog's palace. Here, Rico states, finally I have found it. St. Trina, no, Lord Mikola's cadaver. I have partaken of untold secrets, such that I may aid you O Lord, so please I hope you welcome your humble servant Rico into your dream, the world of your heart. So Rico believed that he was finally going to be able to aid Mikola and enter his dream, now that he'd found him in the physical world. Before the DLC trailer was revealed, I would have said, yeah, I reckon the DLC will take us to Mikola's dream world. It sounds like the perfect place for DLC, yep. right? But now, with the recent trailer, sabemos. it can't be that simple. Because the interviews featured in my DLC video make it quite clear that Mikola's cadaver will instead take us to the Land of Shadow, a place that was once physically a part of the Lands Between before it was veiled and obscured by Queen Marika. In that video, we speculated that the Land of Shadow might be a place where the dead go. We speculated that it might be a kind of afterlife, or at least it might have once been a sort of afterlife before the Erd Tree sort of took over that role. We reason this because Mikola is said to have divested himself of his flesh to get there. The poem reads, It was to this land that Mikola departed, divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage, of all things golden. Of course, we don't yet know the true nature of the Land of Shadow, but it is kind of fitting for Saint Trina, of all people, to have died to arrive in this place, because death in Elden Ring has long been linked to sleep. For example, when Roger succumbs to Deathroot, he says this. Lately, I feel I'm on the precipice of falling into a deep, fathomless slumber and I have an inkling it could spell trouble for you somehow. Roger is almost hinting that he might be a threat in some realm beyond sleep. And he's kind of right, because later we do find Roger, yep. or a part of his vitality at least, which has been weaponized. Fear, sorry, fear. Boys. We do this inside of Godwin's deathbed dream, a phrase that obviously has sleep connotations as well. So I wonder, with death, being so linked to sleep, could Mikola have planned this death in his own slumber so that he could travel to the Land of Shadow? One piece of evidence for Mikola's death being a sort of deep sleep could be the slumbering egg, which is an owl egg that will never hatch, prized as a symbol of the most sublime slumber. The egg is this powerful parallel to the situation with Mikola's cocoon, Mikola's cocoon was taken by Moog before it was ready to hatch. Just so, this egg is looted from killing an owl. 
and thus is also taken before it was ready to hatch. Perhaps before it was even ready to be born. The owl inside will never hatch, it's essentially dead, and this egg's description reminds us that this state of death is the most sublime slumber there is. So, I conclude oh, that lembro. there's a strong parallel between the slumbering egg and Mikola's cocoon. Touching the arm that extends out of the cocoon will bring us to the land of shadow where Mikola traveled long before us. As per the IGN interview, Miyazaki states that players will be following in Mikola's footsteps in the same way that they followed the blessings of the Sights of Grace in the Lands Between. And of course the player is not the only one who is curious about Mikola. There are several other characters in the world and NPCs who have been following Mikola as well. And the player will encounter them on their journey in the Land of Shadow. And they will make new friends and enemies, we hope. Fittingly, Mikola yes, does have many followers, so does Saint Trina, and while no one seems to know for sure where they disappeared to, it is rumoured. Gideon's dialogue reveals that he suspected Mikola was with the Lord of Blood, and there's even a phantom in the consecrated snowfield who points towards Mogwin Palace's waygate, mm -hmm. and they died knowing exactly who took Mikola as well. And then of course there's Rico, that cut content character who senses their master needs their aid. Indeed, Saint Trina and Mikola seem to live on beyond the death of their flesh. And while the Land of Shadow might not literally be the dream world that many expected it to be, there is evidence that Saint Trina's presence has been felt here. For example, this is Saint Trina's lily in the base game. It looks a bit sad, right? It only has a tiny hint of purple left. So, this is why I wonder, could this lily in the background be a true lily of Saint Trina? It does appear to be more whole, dead. and it appears in a sort of quagmire of sleep here. There's that signature purple sleep hue, and there's a masked character who is slumbering in this place. Incidentally, another thing I missed was that you can actually spy some lilies in the background of this fight as well. Oh. So perhaps this boss is linked to Saint Trina? But I digress. Mikola's actions oh, are well to done. Us. But that still leaves Moog. First up, how did Moog manage to abduct Mikola? Well, earlier we talked about how Moog abducted the war surgeons, presumably to test the accursed blood on them. So already Moog has a bit of a history of Quem disse que ele é boss? Não sei, né? If he can materialize from blood não anywhere, se é boss, não. like this cutscene suggests, and like his sanguine Pode nobles ser até um and bloody comum. fingers seem Pode able ser um to do, boss. well, that would certainly explain how abducting Mikola was relatively easy for him. Especially if Melania was away fighting Radan at the time. So during Mikola's abduction, he was ripped out of the tree. There's clearly a large gap here in the tree-like woman's form, almost as if this figure was pregnant with Mikola. And indeed, Mikola sits atop a giant pelvis bone in Moog's palace, showing just how wholesale he was ripped from the Halig tree itself. The Mother of Truth desires a wound, indeed. So we know what happened, but why? Why did Moog think abducting Mikola was a good idea? I don't know, bro. <sighs> Gonna get demonetized for that one. Moog believed Mikola could have transitioned from Empyrean to God. Maybe even Mikola believed that he could. And I think Moog wanted to take advantage of this process and take Thanks. advantage of the new <laughs> God that would soon rise. The remembrance of the Blood Lord reads, Wishing to raise Mikola to full godhood, Moog wished to become his consort, taking the role of monarch. But no matter how much of his bloody bedchamber he tried to share, he received no response from the young Imperium. The wording of bedchamber is appropriate considering Moog is trying to consort with Mikola and become his lord, so to speak. and. It being a bloody bedchamber is appropriate too, as items state that Moog slumbers beside the divinity 
and the cutscene seems to be suggesting that Moog slumbers inside of Mikola's blood. Also, it's very fitting that they use the word slumber here. Dearest Mikola, you must abide alone a while. So if Moog becomes his consort, then Moog will become a lord of sorts, not unlike the dynamic with the Elden Lord that has existed throughout history, where they become consort to their god. But the real question that remains is, how exactly does Mikola become a god in this situation? Considering Mikola's positioning in the womb of this giant tree-like woman, it's easy to assume that what he was attempting was a sort of rebirth here. And this brings me back to Rico's dialogue, the final part where he says, Indeed, I beg you grant my wish, that when you transcend from Empyrean to God, allow me a place by your side. I wonder, what if the cocoon was part of this transition? Mm. It reminds me a lot of Berserk, which Miyazaki is endlessly yep. inspired by, and Spoiler alert if you haven't yet seen it, but a spoiler guys, character spoilers. Here also achieves a similar transition. Griffins. Inside an egg, turning from human to a god of sorts. To become Fucking a part Griffins. of the god hand in this moment and achieve that, his dream, Griffith has to make a sacrifice. And in the end, he chooses to betray his companions, Fido branding them and sealing their fate. In my Mikola video, we Canalia. draw a few parallels between Mikola and Griffith and if Mikola is inspired by Griffith as much as I Cunt. think, then that could be quite concerning, as there is a part of Melania's storyline as well that also seems to be setting up some betrayal to come, although that is of course just speculation. This is probably a good time to talk about the fact that Mikola does have some very ominous overtones to their character. For starters, Saint Trina has an adult form, and it's a one-eyed creature with this spooky mass of elevated hair that is carved upon St. Oh, Trina's torch. What's more, remember St. Trina's sleep fog draws oh, others yeah. down into sleep against oh, their yeah. will. Sleep is a weapon. St. Trina's sword makes that even more clear, as does Cut Content, which states, the saint of the cradle song has become the very symbol of lost repose, yeah, started the, the feeble of heart were powerless to resist her kindness even upon the battlefield. Yeah, Zach, you see how bold so, one. in cut content, at least, the saint of the Cradle Song actually fought in certain wars with kindness. So that description mentions Saint Trina's weaponized kindness, and oh, sim, so like... does this line e, from e, the trailer. Follow? Pure and radiant, he wields love to shrive clean the hearts of men. There is nothing more terrifying. Melania also calls Mikola the most fearsome Empyrean of oh. all. And lastly, the common soldiers of the Halig Tree discovered a bitter truth as they awaited their Lord's return to the Halig Tree. They discovered that Mikola's sacred light would trigger them to self-destruct in their final moments. But even so, they remained loyal. And I quote, May the well, flash of our deaths guide um video de Lordian. So in conclusion, it's so for these reasons that the ring. I'm a bit concerned Glory. about this scary, dreaming demigod, and about the nightmares that might yeah, be incurred by Moog's ritual within, inside the cocoon. A part of me wonders if the formless mother was supposed to be a part of Mikola's ascension to God, considering the ritual happening in Mogwen Palace. That would fit, because a few gods we see in Elden Ring do have an outer god as a patron of sorts. Melania has the outer god of rot, and she is destined to become the goddess of rot. Mm -hmm. Erica becomes a vessel for the Elden Ring, and she is the god of the greater will, who is almost certainly an outer god as well. So all of that sort of answers how Mikola might become a god, as best we can, considering how abstract the game is with these terms. My next question is though, did Mikola foresee any of this happening? The bewitching branch is an item that can pierce a foe and turn them into a temporary ally, and it reads, the Empyrean Mikola is loved by many people. 
Indeed, he has learned very well how to compel such affection. The wording here is kind of sinister, right? The fact that Mikola is capable of consciously compelling affection in order to get what he wants is very manipulative. And if Mikola is capable of masterminding others' affections, Bro. who's to say he hasn't done the same with Moog? Moog's infatuation with Mikola is very obvious and very cursed, considering Mikola's eternal youth and the fact that Mikola is technically Moog's half brother. Again, I'm reminded of this scene with Griffith oh. from Berserk, where Griffith spends a night with a powerful, perverted older man for money, which he needs to achieve his own goals. The man, Genon, is obsessed with Griffith. But to Griffith, Genon is nothing more than a stone lying on the side of the path he walks, and Griffith eventually discards him as such. In my Mikola video, we talked about just how much overlap there is between the characters of Mikola and Griffith, and so I just can't shake the feeling that Mikola might be using Moog But if that's true, why? What would Mikola stand to gain from masterminding this entire situation where he ends up dead and defiled? Before the DLC trailer dropped, I had imagined that Mikola's arm would take us into Mikola's dream world, and so I thought that Mikola might stand to benefit or suffer thanks to Moog's actions upon his slumbering form. I thought he might have even been co-opting the formless mother for his ascension into a god. But now, from what we understand about the DLC trailer, the Land of Shadow is a place distinct from Mikola, so the answer becomes different. We know Mikola divested himself of his flesh and grace to get here, so it's harder to imagine that the bloody rituals happening in Mogwin are having any effect on Mikola's self. Moog really might not be getting any response from Mikola for good reason. So I'm going to present one new theory on why Mikola might benefit from being here based on the information we have from the Don't DLC trailer, study it. and it's this. So we know Mikola divested himself of his flesh before reaching the Land of Shadow, right? Mikola estaria and manipulando o Moog. Ele divested himself of his Moog grace to get here. Mikola. He divested himself of his lineage, of all things golden. Divesting yourself of your flesh is hard enough, but divesting yourself of your grace is also difficult. Rani has difficulty with this in her quest line. She divests herself of her flesh finally, but even then she's still linked to the two fingers and has to kill them to be freed completely. So what if Moog was instrumental not just to the process of Mikola dying, but the process of Mikola losing his grace as well. What if, by being doused in accursed blood, Mikola was defiled to the point that grace left him fully? We know that those doused in Moog's Foi accursed blood start to cara. grow omen horns, five hands. and the omen are graceless, and we know that being defiled is something that many people in the lands between fear. The Dung Eater is proof of that. We talked earlier about how they defile people and how those people are terrified of what this means for them and their rebirth. So it is that I think that Mikola might have wanted to die in this manner, to yeah. fall into this state of sublime slumber and also to be defiled to the point where Grace leaves him. But that's just a theory. And of course, we don't have all of the pieces theory. of the story yet. and. I think it's impossible to say for sure which direction his story will go. I think this state of speculation is very much exactly where From Software wants us to be at this point. Even the all-knowing doesn't know what's going on here. So Mikola was with the Lord of Blood after all. That is some fine intelligence indeed. Well, I wonder what comes next. If he continues his slumber within the cocoon, all would be well. But perhaps it would be safer to destroy it. Mikola is the one thing that remains a mystery to me. So, what do you think? Did Mikola anticipate being taken from the Halig Tree? Will he be affected by the Lord of Blood's machinations? Nah. Moog certainly believes so. In nah. fact, Moog believes this even beyond the very moment Tá of tudo sob controle do Mikola. Ele quer isso. As clear as day. 
O Mog está errado. Mog win. Before I go, let me tell you a little story about a game that was scheduled to release on June 21st. Inocia. So this Tô is ligado. Inotria, a Souls-like title inspired Acabou by vídeo. Italian folklore and history, which gives it an extremely unique vibe. Hashtag For example, this Eu is Quinta, jogo. the game's interessante. opening area, rendered no gorgeously da... in Unreal Engine Italiano. 5 here. I love blah, the blah, blah. verticality in these Looks scenes. Cool. I think there's going to be so much level design they can play with there. And I was very excited to explore this Mediterranean world. But then Elden Ring announced its DLC <laughs> for the same day as their uh, release. Ah, é o no mesmo dia, né? Luckily, however, I've heard they're announcing a new release date soon. Now, I don't usually take Souls-like sponsorships uh, unless it's something I've played. They're going to throw the day of the announcement because of the DLC of Elden Ring. Since the devs for this game weren't strict on what I had to say okay, here, I decided errado. to take this one. Because they're clearly é, é, happy for their product to speak for itself, and I think that kind of confidence is awesome. The gameplay trailer mentions huge skill trees, spells, buffs, passives, and a special type of equipment called masks, which I'm very excited about. Who's going to play this game? 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 Who's going to play For a Souls-like for me. É, seria a melhor opção the lançar antes, porque mesmo se lançar uma semana depois, tipo, Sekiro, as I pessoas love. vão estar jogando so, ainda a DLC, like right? pages, ou rejogando, talvez. Pode ser um programa para eles, pode ser um, pode ser um programa bom. E ele é de louca, salve, mano. Boa noite. Terminar uns vídeos, viu? Maravilha, hein? Tá aí o vídeo. Quem quiser deixar o likezinho. Muito interessante. Vai pelo follow. O que eles estão falando aqui nos comentários? É sexo. <risos> Essa sequência foi muito boa. Eu não tinha percebido. Eu não tinha percebido essa sequência. Tudo bom contigo. Muito interessante, velho. Aí, o que, que faltou aqui? Faltou a uh, Lore of the Dragons do Elder Ring Lore Playlist. Ué, eu assisti? Não, assisti não, pô. Ah, só faltou esse. So you've become... A Lore dos Dragões. Mas é 1 hora e 42 minutos de vídeo. É o maior vídeo da playlist. Por isso tá faltando ele só. 1 hora e 40. My God! Isso é giga chan, é? Cara, vai dar 3 da manhã. Em, o, em outra oportunidade a gente assiste esse. Só pra finalizar a playlistinha de. A playlistinha de. Erring Lord do, do VAT. O Mario com essa, não vou tancar. 3 da manhã já. Bom, enfim. Chegamos ao fim. Muito legal esse vídeo. Em outra oportunidade, vamos assistir. Ok? Esse último. Dois dos dragões. Os de curiosidade são bem legais também. Tem os de curiosidade. Lori Shorts. Não. Eldering Secrets. Deve ser esse, né? Esse aí. Ah, 12, 15, 26. São mais curtinhos. A gente pode ver, né? 
Did you know you could do this? Depois. Muito interessante. Mas por hoje, a gente encerra por aqui. Quero agradecer a presença de todos. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. Próximo stream. É... Quarta-feira, né? Quarta-feira vai ter aula. Então, provavelmente por volta das 11 da noite. Tamo de volta aí. Com Celeste. Eu vou tentar. Vou tentar jogar Celeste. Vamos ver como que vai dar. Vai que eu gosto. Não sei. Muito obrigado aí. Boa noite a todos. Vamos de bad. O voo das 11 da noite estamos de volta, hein? Beleza? Abrisar de dedo? Ei! Tu acha que eu não tenho? Que isso? Hum.